What was I going to say? Oh, well, here, check this out. I hate, I hate these EMGs with all, everything, but look at this. This is a nice, really nice. This ain't no copy, this ain't no nothing. It is a Charvel Star. So when, I don't know if you guys remember when I bought that black uh, Rhodes with the uh, bar. And I was thinking like an idiot because I was a little, meh. So this is like 2012, 11, 12. And it was hanging on, you know, down at Guitar Center. And they wanted 3000 3500 I'm thinking, that's pretty cheap. And it said, you know, Michael Shannon, 11, number 11. So I've got another Michael Shannon uh, auto, or signed guitar. But this one said 11. And I looked up the serial number. I, you know, I went down there for like three days in a row. And I'm, I'm you know, haggling with them because they didn't have a case. I'm like, man, this is a, I need a case for this, you know, because it's like an old Jackson. And it's, you know can't quite pinpoint what it was but it played like crap the neck was just it wasn't like this it was like this I'm like what is wrong with this piece of thing so I talked them down to a thousand dollars which right there I knew something is wrong so <laughs> So I bought it, brought it home, gave it to my tech, said the truss rods broke, and this thing needs a lot of work. I'm like, but it looks so good. <laughs> I mean, you know, I wanted, it, it looks exactly, almost, like the one they were going to send him, except, you know, Diego knows what the difference is. He's got the black one and they put the uh, you know the inlays in upside down so the white there's a white one with no trim no uh, bar on it and a black one with a bar and they both have the in upside down inlays so who knows who's got the white one I mean I'm not Ugh! but Diego is a friend of mine on Facebook and YouTube and he bought it. I think he paid five grand for it, had it fixed up. You know, I think Jack, I think Mike Shannon fixed it up for him. And yeah, that that would be a that would be a cool guitar to have. I think I would buy that, if like especially for five grand, definitely. So, anyways, I wasn't gonna take it back down to Guitar Center because I've already I just bought it for a thousand dollars. They're not gonna do nothing. They're gonna you know take it back maybe or trade so I took it to Jackson down Fender let's say and they're like wow this is you know blah, blah, blah. we can fix this up and uh, we can fix this up for you and I'm like how much and they're like yeah you know it, it was uh, it wasn't cheap but I'm like yeah you know what I really don't want it I mean, I don't believe it could be what it could be. I go, what year is it? He goes, it's a, it's another run. It's not, it's not an '80s. And I'm like, oh well, then I don't care. I don't care. Then it was some special run, like a 10-year anniversary thing, where they did the white one and they did a black one, and they were doing all these, you know, things. And apparently, that was number 11 of like the black one except the they corrected the inlays should have had the inlays upside down that would have made it more you know wife-like or more accurate wife-like so i said you know what why don't you trade me they're like well what do you want i'm like well 
does it have to be in Jackson? Oh, they're like, look at Jackson, Charvel, EVH, they're all here. Uh, I go, well, what is this worth to you, the guitar? They're like, well, pick out a guitar. You start picking out guitars. I go, well, I love stars. So the first one they showed me was this. And I'm like, oh, do you have anything without EMG, EMGs in it? So I like the way this looked with the inlays. They're kind of like, uh, what do you call it? BC Rich inlays. I just put a new battery in, but I think the best, this isn't new, new, because it still sounds like crap to me. Um, but I'm like, I'll take this and I'll just deal with the, the pickup crap later. But I never did. Uh, it's still got, and it's got one knob and one, because I was figuring, okay, so who cares about this? Uh, I'll just put a uh, super distortion in here, and this will be the kill, and this will be the volume. So that's the plan for this, because I hate EMGs. Listen to this. <laughs> sounds horrible it sounds thin there's no chunk it sounds like Metallica now um I mean I like Metallica but they never got that guitar sound that they had on uh, Master of Puppets to meet us so okay so there's some my neighbor very inconsiderate idiots I don't know what they don't do anything. The guy never leaves home. They all have, you know, Mercedes, Bentleys, you know, BMWs, low-end BMW cars, I guess, is their low-end. But they got these, you know, five, six cars, uh, a fat wife, a stupid little pot-bellied husband, and they just popped out two kids since they moved in a few years ago. And, uh, they always sit their own parties, and the wife gets drunk, and she starts yelling. And... So they're throwing this big party, and I got 
you know, stuff growing out there. I'm trying to get some plants to take out on the parkway. So I blocked the parking with a trash can, and these stupid idiot people picked the trash can up and put it right on the plant. So I went out there, I'm like, dude, what are you, stupid? He goes, what's up, man? I'm like, what's up is going to be my fist in your face. Put the friggin' can in the street and pull in somehow. How long are you going to be? We'll be here all night. I go, no, you won't, because I'll call the cops. So, it's just, you know, and to, for me, that was incredible that I did just did that, and I didn't, you know, kick him in the face or start screaming. My neighbor did. He's done that. Because these majority of the neighbors are just, they don't give a crap. And if you start yelling at them, they go, look at this is America. Freedom. We're allowed to, we're free to do anything we want. Okay, this is Armenian people. I'll just sit so you know. We just, they all moved into Glendale and now in Burbank. I mean, they are everywhere. All neighbors. Every single one is an Armenian. That guy's cool. These people deal drugs. Literally. They own a pharmacy. They deal drugs out of that house. These people are idiots. Always getting drunk. People across the street, they're cool. People across the street, they're cool. But these two, of course, on each side, are always throwing parties. Drug dealer and fat, uncontrollable, drunk woman who's got two little kids. How's this for rock and roll? That's why I'm always taking off and getting out of California. I can't stand it. But I'm needed here for certain things. So there you go. You know what I'm trying to play there, that rat song, but I don't know what, how, what it goes into. <laughs>
change it. If someone asked me about Striper, you know, at the time I thought, well, that's, you know, the exact opposite of what I want. A guy, a singer that sounds like the guy from Styx. And I hate that singer. Not the guy in Striper. I don't hate him. It's the guy in Styx I don't like. But he does sound like that singer. I can't remember the name. So, I'm like, well, the band is good, but that's a lot of yellow, because it used to be the yellow and black attack or whatever. They got it all from the, you know, this all started around the Van Halen thing, the, the black and yellow guitar. Everybody started doing that, 79, 80, everybody. So, the first band was called Rock's Regime. They had a guitar player that had the perfect, like mine was, he turned into. But see, I was like 17, I think, or 18. 17. Rock's Regime guy. And I'm like, look at that freaking guitar player's hair. I go, we got to go see these guys. Just so I can see his hair and ask him how he got it to look like that. Because it was like Nicky, but long. And, you know, Mick never did it. His was just kind of sticking up, and it looked cool. It was Mick. But Tommy's and Vince, they, they never really were one for hair. It was all about Nicky and his the way he could do it. And that's how I did it. I flipped my head over, and, it, you know, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of damn work and a lot of damn hairspray. But uh, so I went down there to see the band with a friend of mine, and... But my girlfriend was there and she was taking pictures of the guy and I'm like oh can I get you pictures like yeah he's happy I go can I get one from the side he goes okay and he's like I go now the back he goes you what do you want I go your hair dude how do you get it like that I want every angle so I can show it to the girl that cuts my hair so I can get my hair to look like yours he's like wow thanks at least the you know I'm noticed for something because he was out of Rock's regime and they had become Striper. So with Striper doing the the, the Christian thing, which is good, I mean I'll, I'm all for it. Now, I mean at the time I'm like, oh boo hiss, I want, you know, everybody wants rebellion and you know, pentagrams and stuff. And I had my pentagram on and all that stuff. So they were playing with Witch. Now Witch was a really really bad copy of Motley Crue. I mean, they had you know, Peter Wabbit, Ronnie 2, uh, something, Peter Wabbit, da 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 and Ronnie 2. It, but there was like goofy names. And, you know, they did this whole, you know, they basically looked like a bad version of Motley Crue. And they sound like a really bad version of Motley Crue. But they look cool. So we figured, eh, we'll go see them. They could actually almost fill up the country club, almost, just on their looks. And they had an EP out, which I bought, and it sucks. Very similar to Carrie Dolls. <laughs> Carrie Dolls EP. His new CD is actually really good. You 
check it out. Or the last CD he put out a couple years ago. So, uh, yeah, I went down there, saw Rock's regime, and just to get the guy's hair, just to get a look at his hair. Then Striper turns in, so I go to the country club and receive to see him. And Witch is headlining, and then Striper, I think. Or it might have been Striper headlining him. Because Striper got big quick. Because all of these kids that were afraid, to, you know, now they had a band that they could, you know, tell their parents about. They're Christian. They throw Bibles out to the eye. Dude, they would fling them like that. You get hit in the face. With, I almost got clocked with one of those Bibles. So, because they were throwing out, like, the Gideon Bible at first, and now, you know, a hardcover type. And then they went to the soft cover, just, and then I think they have their own Bible. I don't know what they do now. I haven't seen them in years, but I bought the last two albums. The last album is pretty good. The album before it is really good. It's probably their heaviest album they ever did. But this guy's like, oh, yeah, Tim Gaines, he was in Stormer. I, I saw Stormer a million times. I think I saw, I got it, yeah, it's, uh, they played with Motley Crue at the uh, Troubadour. It was something, Stormer, and Motley Crue. It's on that white ticket. I, that's somebody, Stormer, Motley Crue. But Storm was getting put in everywhere. I saw, it. what was it? What was it? There was a band that was before Great White, which I hate. I despise Great White. I don't know why. I just don't like him. I met the old guitar player. He was very nice. We talked. Uh, he bought me some drinks. This was at the FM station. And... I don't know why, he just came up to me and started talking, he's like, you know, I've seen you around, I'm like, yeah, and I'm just like, you know, blah, blah. and he's, he's alone, there was no one with him, and you know, he had that hat on, and that chubby face, they all had chubby faces in that band, just, they bugged me, because they were actually really old men trying to do it, and they got that one hit, which sucked, I thought. <laughs> saying that I was playing lack of communication on the guy. I'm like, no, I wasn't. I forgot how that, how does that go? <laughs> That's a tuned down thing, right? I think so. of knowing what I'm doing. 
So yeah, really. So after the show at the country club, which which sucked, of course, and I never really talked to them, like because they, you know, I figured once I get a band going, you guys are done. And by the time I got a band going, they were done. And I didn't want any of them because they all sucked. The singer sucked. The drummer sucked. The drummer was horrible. The bass player sucked, and the guitar sucked. So, but you know, they're, hey, they're signed to F&A Records. They actually got back together and started playing gigs out here like five, six years ago and sold like 50 CDs. F&A Records sucks. Remember, if you're if you're signed to them already, get out and don't let the next label you go to or try just go to CD baby forget it all of these labels like that like FNA are in it for the money and you will get nothing so just go to CD baby and release it yourself dude that's what all that's all I'm doing because there was two labels that wanted to release fatal attraction a best of and then uh my thing whenever it comes out. And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. But I kept thinking, you know what? I'm going to get screwed over just like I did with F&A. No one buys records. Everybody downloads stuff. So CD Baby, they do everything. They do everything. If you want CDs, they'll press them. If you want a few records, they'll press them. I'm thinking, man, yeah, maybe one, maybe five records, you know. But the main thing I want is, you know, digital downloading. Because, you know, that's the good thing about having a son that's into metal and all that crap. Is he's like, I haven't bought a CD in years. I just download everything. I'm like, on the what? Goes, well, on my phone or computer, to, you know, whatever. But he's not dumb and listens to it on his phone. Like, man, this is really defense sounding. Like, you probably watch these, and you're like, mm, that sucks. Well, if you put your headphones on, even if it sucked, it would sound good. So, we went nowhere with this. Oh, yeah. So, I went up to Oz Fox. Told him, dude, your amp sound, you, you got a great tone. Who does your work? He told me, the same guy that was doing work on my uh, Marshall. So, I'm like, eh, figures. So, and, uh... And I don't remember who it was that did the first mod on my white Marshall. Like, they're not around anymore, and I don't—I can't remember the guy that used to do it. It wasn't the guy that Van Halen guy it was somebody else, but he did an amazing mod. The guy from White Sister uh, had a mod on his, and he wasn't like a great guitar player, but he—he he took lessons from Randy. He was friends with Randy. And he had two V's, exactly two Sandoval V's, blue with white stars and black with white stars. I think they might have been both blue with white stars instead of polka dots. And I thought well, that looks freaking cool, man. Maybe I'll get that someday. Hey, he's dead now. Rick Chaddock, White Sister. Look it up, man. Their first album, very good, very, very, very good. I'm not holding you guys' attention at all, am I? Okay, so, let me think. Um, I told you about the David Lee Roth thing at the Whiskey. And he was he started, he did, he was hanging around. As soon as Motley Crue got big, he was there every night. They played the Whiskey. And they played the Whiskey a lot. I think I saw him at the Roxy three times. Motley Crue. They never played Gazari, so when they show that in the, in the thing, that, that's wrong. Uh, they played the whiskey a lot. And Diamond Day was there. And there was uh, upstairs, and you know, there was downstairs, the bar, and tables, and upstairs, the bar. You'd be at the upstairs bar, ready to just go into the backstage, and then whenever. You know, once this is because when they first started playing and we went there, me and my friend just walked right backstage and I got mixed autograph, and then that was it. That was the beginning. There, this is like no one was there, 
really trying to get backstage and, you know, meet them. Well, a couple girls, but they all had girlfriends, and the girlfriends were there. Mick didn't, but uh, Tommy did, Vince did, and their girlfriends were there. So they were pfft, screwed, so they ended up splitting. And, uh, you know, Mick and Nikki would stick around. That's how, that's how, in the beginning, January, February, March, 81. And then as they got bigger and bigger, Mick talked to me and my friend, George, from the beginning all the way to the Shout at the Devil when they went on that tour. And then he took off on a mission, my friend, and I became a father, and I, that was it. To me, Motley Crue ends at Shout at the Devil. Because I'm like, wow, they put out friggin' looks to kill. I'm like, of course, these guys rule. And they put out, a, you know, a Too Young to Fall in Love. I'm like, where's their boots? Why do they look like idiots? Why do they look like heroin addicts? Or drunks? So I wasn't thrilled with the that one. And then, uh, yeah, they started, you know, the boots were gone. Except for Mick. Mick stayed. Mick, he always stays dark and leather. Never put on spandex.